Okay, hands up all those people who plan on burning out. Okay, hands up all those people who plan on having a child with FASD. Yeah, similarities, aren't there? No one plans on it happening. Um, I'm going to talk about FASD, uh, and this is the brief synopsis of what we'll be talking about. It'll be death by PowerPoint, so we'll be moving through it pretty quickly. Uh, what is it? How's it caused? What's it look like? What happens to people with FASD? How common is it? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And I'm also going to talk about the role that men play in FASD because it's a very important one and not very often talked about. So what is it? So there's going to be similarities between my talk and Vicky's. Um, we're going to use slightly different language because we didn't. Uh, we didn't uh, collaborate beforehand, but my definition is it's an invisible brain-based disability that usually manifests itself behaviourally, and most children look normal, in inverted commas. Um, and it's caused by prenatal alcohol exposure, and like many other spectrum disorders, yes, it is a spectrum. It goes from severe, so the severe end of the spectrum is fetal alcohol syndrome, where people do look different, but right down to uh, what's called neurobehavioural disorder or the Australian terminology is neurodevelopmental disorder, alcohol exposed, where children look just like everybody else, but the problem is that their brain doesn't work in the same way. And often we base our expectations for behaviour and ability on how tall someone is, how old they are, uh, and to a certain extent what sort of language they use. How's it caused? Alcohol's the strongest teratogen in general use. So a teratogen is something that causes damage to an unborn baby. So alcohol's been around for at least 2,000 years. But if it hadn't been, just to have a little hypothetical speculation, and if some genius came up with alcohol and tried to market it today, it would not be allowed because it is too toxic in too many different ways to be allowed freely on the market. So we have alcohol because of its historical context. It freely crosses the placenta, and if you want to make yourself an instant expert on FASD, the answer to everything is 60. Okay, so if anybody asks you how many pregnancies in Australia are unplanned, it's 60. About 60% 60 of women in Australia consume some alcohol in pregnancy, and about 60% of people with FASD will one day confront the juvenile justice system. Or confront the justice system, not necessarily the juvenile justice system. And do all children who are exposed to alcohol get FASD? No. The conversion rate is actually relatively low because it depends on all those things you can see on the screen. So if mum has genetics that enable her to metabolise alcohol quickly, that will mean that her blood alcohol concentration is, remains relatively low compared to someone who metabolises alcohol slowly where their blood alcohol concentration is likely to be higher. It also depends on the size of the person because if you pour a bottle of wine into someone who weighs 50 kilos, the concentration will be higher than if you pour the same bottle of wine into someone who weighs 100 kilos just because of the distribution. Um, it also depends on the timing and exposure in the first trimester is worse because that's when everything's been made from scratch. And recent uh, animal research indicates there's probably a crucial window of exposure in the third week of pregnancy and at that point, the fetus is one millimetre in diameter. Um, the type of drinking, binge drinking, is worse simply because blood alcohol concentration is likely to be much higher. So as you would be aware, the current recommendation is no alcohol in pregnancy because we just don't know what the safe lower limit is or indeed if there is one. And no one really wants to play Russian roulette trying to find out what the safe lower limit is. Um, until 2000, this is a recommendation from 2009. Until 2009, the recommendation was one standard drink per day or seven standard drinks in a week. So it's only quite recently uh, that this has come into play. So is FASD deliberate? Absolutely not. 
uh, the great majority of parents I see, and I see many parents every year, want the absolute best for their children. They want their children's lives to be better than their own life. That's a pretty normal thing. So exposure is usually inadvertent because you all being experts in FASD know the answer to the next question. 60% of pregnancies in Australia are unplanned. And if your pregnancy is unplanned, then you may not intentionally be avoiding alcohol. Uh, so exposure is frequently before the pregnancy was discovered. And I would say 95% of the mums that I see tell me, as soon as I realised I was pregnant, I stopped drinking and there was no other alcohol for the rest of the pregnancy. Okay, what does FASD look like? So, as Vicky mentioned, it has three main areas. The most important one is obviously the brain. So it affects the brain in a diffuse manner such that every person with FASD looks different from anyone else and there is no consistent phenotype no consistent behavioural phenotype for FASD. It can also affect the face, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and also growth. So they're the three big areas, brain, face, and growth. So the brain domains affected, again, crossover with Vicky's presentation, communication, speech and language. And if you can't most of us use language to communicate our social and emotional wants, so there's, a, there's an obvious flow on to that. But separately, memory, cognition, how smart you are, executive function, that's planning and focusing your attention. Attention control and obvious spin-offs from that are really academic performance and adaptive skills. Adaptive skills are really self-help skills. How do you function in the real world, getting dressed, getting organised, looking after yourself? So they're the brain domains that we actually test for in our clinic. Uh, and in terms of the face, so for children at the severe end of the spectrum, there are three areas of the face that are consistently and specifically related to alcohol. And these are the philtrum, so if everybody just runs their finger across their top lip, you'll probably have a little dent there. That little dent is called the philtrum, believe it or not. It's got its own anatomical name and it corresponds to a particular structure that's underneath the skin. Kids with fetal alcohol syndrome don't have a philtrum, so if they were to run their finger across their lip, it'd be completely smooth. Um, and also, most of us have a nice cupid's bow shape to our upper lip, but as you can see, the little girl in the photo has a very thin upper lip. Um, and then the other thing is the eye openings. You can see on her left eye there, she has the letters A and B. So we actually measure how wide the eye openings are. And believe it or not, there are standardised percentile charts for... Uh, eye opening length uh, across different races uh, for different ages and different sexes just in the same way that there are growth charts for babies, heights, weights and head circumference. <coughs> um, the uh, lip filtrum guides you can see on the right have been developed at the University of Washington and there's one for Caucasian faces and another one for African American faces and they're what we use to guide our assessment of facial features. Our assessment of facial features is all done using uh, facial analysis software because it's very hard to analyse the face of a child who may be running vigorously around your consultation room. So usually we try and get some good digital photos and then we can analyse the face and measure the eye openings at our leisure. Okay, there's just two photos of older children, teenagers, and you can see again, they have um, uh, very smooth philtrum and very thin upper lips, and you'll just have to take my word for their eye openings. Growth, um, growth-wise, we're really looking at three main parameters, height, weight, and head circumference. So children at the severe end of the spectrum often have, they're often short, uh, and if they're not short, they tend to be um, skinny for their height. 
uh, children more severely affected have very small heads. So a head circumference that's less than the third percentile is significant because the reason that your head grows is because it's driven by brain growth. So a small head equilibrates to a small brain, which is not a good thing. Now this is just a little chart identifying how many alcohol exposed children have abnormal facial features and as you can see it's only 17%. So 83% of children with FASD actually look completely normal, which is again echoing Vicky's point that this is an invisible brain-based disability manifested by a behavioural phenotype. Um, and uh, significant numbers have cognitive delays, language delays, or diagnoses of hyperactivity. And frequently we would see children that come to us with multiple diagnoses, including ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, learning difficulties, speech language impairment, anxiety, depression, OCD, and quite often many of those diagnoses in combination. Um, and it's only when we make a diagnosis of FASD that the parent has a sensation of overwhelming relief because at last they actually understand the totality of their children's problem. Mm. And they understand why none of the previous diagnoses actually explained everything about their child. Uh, here's some mouse data. So from the left on your screen, we have a little mouse um, who is a normal little mouse, and below that little mouse, mouse A, is corresponding mouse brain F. Now that mouse hasn't been exposed to any alcohol in gestation, but as we move from left to right, there's increasing exposure of alcohol in pregnancy, and as you can see, the face becomes very abnormal in that the filtrum disappears, that little dent in the top lip disappears, um, the lip disappears, and indeed the whole face and the whole head becomes much smaller. Now, as goes the face, goes the brain, because they develop at the same gestational age and they actually develop from the same tissues. So if you have abnormal facial development, it's invariably paralleled by abnormal brain development. And as you can see, right across on the right-hand side, face E and corresponding brain J are markedly abnormal. So FASD is not subtle. FASD is like someone took a shotgun to your genes and just randomly blasted them. And I'll show you some more information on that in a minute. So what happens to people with FASD in the long run? A landmark study done in 2003 um, conducted a life history interview using 450 questions, and these are the results that were revealed. 94% had problems with mental health, significant percentages of depression, and very significant percentages of suicide, both attempted and threatened. Disrupted school is the norm rather than the exception. And as you can see there, by adulthood, 70% re reported disruptions to school. And the sorts of problems that appeared are the problems that would come through any child development, general paediatric or child mental health clinic, question mark ADHD, question mark learning difficulties, question mark language impairment, question mark anxiety. Trouble with the law, there's your magic 60% number again. Um, but probably of even more concern is that as people progress through the lifespan, offending tends to become worse and more serious, including theft, assault, domestic violence, murder, property damage, sexual assault. Inappropriate sexual behaviour is high and probably much higher if one considers the bias to under-reporting. Confinement, being locked up. As an inpatient for mental health or drug use, 60%, and incarceration in jail, more than 40% of adults, and the other figures below that. 
Alcohol and drug use, approximately five times the general background rate. So as you can see, none of these are happy outcomes. And if you roll all those together, the chances of the person being able to live independently are low, in that 80% ended up needing to live with someone else in order to assist them to live their lives. What are the protective factors? How can we turn some of this around? So early diagnosis is a universal protective factor for the development of all those secondary disabilities that I've just mentioned. Hence the emphasis that we've taken on the Gold Coast in trying to provide a service that allows that to happen. Um, being eligible for services is also a protective factor. So paradoxically, that cohort in the US, it was people who had IQs less than 70 that did better. People with IQs over 70 did worse. And that was because if your IQ is less than 70, you're eligible for a whole range of services. Whereas if your IQ is over 70, you're not eligible for a whole range of services. And that's very interesting because that's almost exactly the same system that we have in Australia. In that children at school, their IQ is 69, they get additional services, but if it's 72, 3 or 4, they don't, even though for all practical um, circumstances, it would be very difficult to pick the functional difference between those two children. Living in a stable home is a protective factor and protection from domestic violence and or gang membership is also a significant protective factor. How common is it? Do Australians, oops, sorry, wrong slide. Okay, it's the leading preventable cause of developmental disability in the Western world. And more children are born each year with FASD than with autism, spina bifida, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome and SIDS combined. So it's very significant, but it doesn't seem to get the airplay that any one of those other disorders already has. Do Australians drink much alcohol? Yes, that's usual response, sort of muted laughter. Okay, so here's a map. Total alcohol consumption per capita in people over the age of 15 years. So even though there are some people who drink under the age of 15 years, they've been taken out of this calculation. And the calculation is in litres of pure 100% alcohol per person. So as you can see there, Australia is in the 10 to 12.4 litres of pure ethanol alcohol per person per year. But if you were to remove all the people who don't actually drink anything or who drink very little, then consumption in drinkers is obviously much, much higher than 12 litres of pure alcohol per year. Okay, do Australians abstain from much? Oh, we'll just go back to the other slide. It's interesting to point out that the only, the only countries that have beaten us in this little co competition are really Russia and the Baltic states. Okay, apart from that, we're almost the winner. Okay, prevalence of abstention in the last 12 months. And as you can see, again, Australia's a winner because less than 20% of people in Australia over the age of 15 years abstain from any alcohol in the previous 12 months. And somewhat paradoxically, we're beaten by, or we're in the same league as the UK, um, France, Denmark, Sweden, etc. So just to make it a little bit more real, this is some Australian data looking at secondary school students' use of tobacco, alcohol, and over-the-counter illicit substances. Uh, between the ages of uh, 11 and 18. And as you can see, in 2011, 50% um, of males and females had consumed alcohol in the previous year, about 30% in the previous month, and about 20% in the previous week, and 5 to 7% had binged in the previous week. These are all children 
at high school. So if we do the maths in Australia, how many people could actually be affected? What are we talking about in terms of burden of disease? So let's just look at the Gold Coast, a place near and dear to my heart. In 2011, the population was 507,642. And a paper published in 2014 put the prevalence rate at between 2 and 5% in Western societies just like ours. And so if we do the maths on the Gold Coast for 2%, that means there are 10,000 people living on the Gold Coast with FASD or 25,000 if we do prevalence at 5%. And in comparison, uh, diabetes is about 20,000, ASD is about 5,000, childhood cancer is 620 diagnosed per year Australia-wide, and the chances of being abducted and murdered by a stranger, less than a million. And just on that note, if you left your child on the front, front step, how long would it take them to be abducted? And the answer is 620,000 years. Okay, so Australia is a very, very safe society, even though, even though the tabloid news would have you think otherwise. <clears throat> so if they're out there for a few minutes, probably doesn't really matter. So what have we got? So potentially on the Gold Coast, 25,000 individuals who have functional impairments in behaviour, mental health, learning, cognition, language, and the ability to understand language as well as memory and executive function. Let's do the prevalence Australia-wide. 5% prevalence Australia-wide is 1.15 million people. 2% prevalence is 462,000. It's a lot. A lot of people are affected by FASD. Just imagine that if we came up with an intervention that made a difference to their functional abilities so they could participate more avidly in the community and in the workforce and employment. Just imagine that this led to each member being able to pay $1,000 in extra tax per year. The difference into the Australian tax base would be $1.15 billion a year, plus the opportunity cost of them needing less services for which our community already pays for, be that being in jail, being the recipient of Centrelink or special education services. Now, I say these things in a purely speculative and provocative fashion. The numbers may actually be less. It is possible they might be higher. We actually don't know at this point in time because there are insufficient diagnostic services across the country to even determine a best guess at accurate prevalence. Diagnosis. We tend to use recognised guidelines that have been well established overseas. I won't bore you with the detail. Suffice to say, it may make its way into the next edition of DSM and is currently listed in the back pages as a condition for further study. The importance of accurate diagnosis is that it guides intervention. Accurate diagnosis provides a template or potential templates to predict the future. It informs prognosis, allows prevention, allows accurate prevalence data, as I've discussed, may lead to access to services, and may lead to allocation of resources. So a diagnosis is different to a label. A label is something you, that you put on a jam jar. A diagnosis does all these things. Alcohol and men. <clears throat> And just very quickly, there is a direct effect of alcohol on spermatogenesis and an indirect effect by the partner facilitating the other person's drinking. 75% of those who drank in pregnancy did so with the partner and on 40% of occasions it was initiated by men. 
So the overwhelming uh, moral to that story is that boys and men can make a very significant difference and should be included in any education and intervention around FASD. Mouse model shows that epigenetic changes are transmitted through the male line and take two to three generations to wash out. So that means that if my grandfather was exposed to alcohol in utero and the subsequent generations were teetotal, I could still be affected by that exposure which has been passed down epigenetically. Now that's getting really scary if that comes to fruition. Um, this is a map of m m uh, mice chromosomes, which is why there's only 19 plus X and Y. And it just shows you the changes uh, in methylation. Methylation is something that is a switch to turn genes on and off. And it just shows you that pretty much every gene was affected in some degree, but there were very significant changes on chromosome 10, 7 and chromosome X. Um, so this is what I meant when I said if a alcohol is not subtle, it's like someone took a shotgun to your genes and just splattered every one of them, changing the way that they express themselves. Oh, no, this is, this is male and female. So we're just on to just a mouse model here. So little male and female mi mice. This one was actually a boy because there's a Y chromosome there. Okay, what can we do about it? Well, we can prevent it. Uh, I don't know, those of you have heard about a movement called pregnant pause, which is where the father in a relationship would also stop drinking before and during the pregnancy. Uh, we can certainly expand diagnostic services and I believe the way to do this is to upskill all the child development services around the country, of which there are probably 30 at least, but only two of those services are actually currently diagnosing FASD in any sort of comprehensive way. Those services already have the people required to make the diagnosis, but they don't have the skill, knowledge or training. FASD needs to be recognised as a disability through the NDIS in DSM-5 and with that recognition needs to come the provision of early intervention similar to the Helping Children with Autism package and Better Start packages that are currently available for other diagnoses. Until 2014 there were no multidisciplinary diagnostic services in Australia for FASD and training was only available in Canada and the USA whereas our colleagues across the ditch, as well as beating us in rugby, were also beating us in FASD, in that they have 12 teams already established. In December 2013, we took a team to Vancouver. We received training, commenced our clinic in 2014, ably supported by funding from those organisations for which I'm eternally grateful. The referral criteria at the moment are children naught to 10, with a definite history of prenatal alcohol exposure who have developmental or behavioural problems. In addition to this, we've started to run training courses for other clinicians uh, to further our desire to upskill child development services, paediatricians, child psychologists around the country, and they're currently running in April and November. Uh, for any referrals, should be directed to either that phone number or that uh, email address. Thank you.